So we continue to read from the Saints of Braj, page number 357, chapter 35. The story of Sri Radharaman Das Babaji. Living to die in Vrindavan is regarded yes, I'm not you, sir, please. Sorry. as the surest. Wait, somebody said something. I really forgot the mic. Living to die in Vrindavan as the surest shortcut <coughs> to eternal life of loving service to Radha Krishna in transcendental Vrindavan. Sanat Kumara Samhita says, if a man only surrenders to Vrindavan, that is, lives here with faith and devotion until the end, then he has nothing else to do in order to attain the highest end. Vrindavan, by virtue of its own nature as a manifestation of the internal potency of Bhagavan, which consists of Sat, Chit, and Ananda, gives him the Parampad, that is, a place in the highest transcendental region which is the transcendental Vrindavan itself, without considering his merit or demerit. Sanat Kumara Samhita 32.5 But since the Adishwari, Empress of Vrindavan, is Radharani, no one can die here if he or she does not have her blessings. It has been noticed that some people who lived in Vrindavan all their life were pushed out of Vrindavan at the end because they did not have her blessings. While some others who lived out of Vrindavan all their life, came here at the end and died here, because they had her blessings. We do have one example, just sorry, <laughs> just say a personal thing. We do have one uh, example of this, uh, one devotee from Terni, Rida Chaitanya, the former husband of Rasalila, he lived all his life out of Vrindavan and the last three months of life knowing to uh, be, have a terminal cancer disease and to die in a few months, he decided to come here to die and he made it. He came here and left his body the last three months, so although all his life was out of Vrindavan. Wow. Sri Radha Raman Das Babaji was one of those exceptionally fortunate persons who was called to Vrindavan by Radharani herself the very day on which he was destined to leave his body so that he might leave it in Vrindavan. Sri Radha Raman was born on April 14. 1932 in Mulati, a village in 24 Paragana of West Bengal, in a respectable Brahmin family. His father, Sri Vinaya Krishna, was a landlord and a famous advocate of Calcutta High Court. <coughs> His mother, Lalita Devi, was a very religious lady. 
She was a disciple of Sri Ram Das Babaji Maharaj, the renowned Siddha saint of Patabhani, Calcutta. She got Radharaman Das also initiated by Ram Das Babaji Maharaj when he was still young. After initiation, a sudden change was noticed in him. He used to retire to a lonely place and meditate for hours. His eyes always swung in tears. In this state, he somehow completed his education and passed the MA examination from the Calcutta University. But when his parents began to negotiate for his marriage, he found himself standing on crossroad. He renounced the world and went to Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, he took Samyas Diksha from Sri Madhav Das Babaji. Then he went to village Maghera, where his elder god brother Sri Ramakrishna Das Baba lived. Under his guidance, he studied Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, and other scriptures. After this, he began to live in Viharvan near village Ral and practice sadhana. <coughs> His absorption in bhajan was so deep that he would not even go for Madhukari every day. <coughs> he went for Madhukari only once or twice a week and collected sufficient rotis, chaparis, to last him for a number of days. When the rotis dried, he dipped them in water and ate. The result was that he developed gastric ulcer. Acute pain in the stomach caused great difficulty in bhajan. He had to go to Kolkata for treatment. He was admitted in a hospital and his younger brother, Sachi Dulal, and niece, Kumari Nandini, attended upon him. But his condition worsened day by day. One day in the evening, the pain in the stomach suddenly became too severe. The doctors were called. He overheard one of them saying to the other, He may vomit blood tonight and die. He was not afraid of death, but his anxiety was that he would die out of Vrindavan in a Calcutta hospital. <laughs> in his anguish, he began to pray to Radharani. O oh, Swamini, the mistress of my heart, why have you turned me out of Vrindavan to die here like a dog? Perchance I have committed some offense. Maybe that instead of doing bhajan, I have only deceived myself and others by aping as one absorbed in bhajan. If I had not done so, you must at least have given me the boon of death in Vrindavan. You thought I did not even deserve to die in Vrindavan. But my Swamini, even though undeserving, am I not yours? 
Even if I have aped, have I aped as someone other than your servant? You are by nature so merciful that even if a man takes your name by mistake, you give him darshan. I do not know why you are so indifferent to me. I do not ask for darshan, because I know I do not deserve it. I ask only for death in Vrindavan. Have mercy on me, Swamini. Have mercy on me. As he said this, he cried aloud in deep distress and became unconscious. His cry did not go in vain. It touched the heart of Radharani. She came running along with Krishna and gave him darshan in his unconscious state. <coughs> With a smile on her face, she showed to him her right hand as if to bless him with that in Vrindavan, while Krishna gently moved his lotus hand on his stomach and asked in a tender voice, Where do you feel pain, Baba? How could Baba say where he was feeling pain and to whom? For the pain, as well as the questioner, had disappeared along with the question, and Radha had disappeared too. The next morning, the doctors were surprised to see that the patient who was writing with excruciating and incurable pain until only eight or ten hours before and should have died by morning, had sat up and was asking for food. <laughs> <laughs> Baba returned to Braj and again began to live in Viharvan. He had regained his health. His stomach pain had disappeared. But he had developed another kind of pain for which no doctor had any treatment. He had begun to feel severe pain in separation from Radha and Krishna. He had felt this pain before, but it was neither so severe nor so constant and unbearable. This was natural because ever since Radha Krishna had responded to his prayer and blessed him, not only with their darshan, but with their winsome smile and affection, he had developed a new conviction a conviction that they were his own more than anyone else. How could he bear the thought that those who were his own more than anyone else be remote from him more than anyone else? In him so much that he ought After some time, 
he went to Jatipura in Govarda and began to live in a cave which is known as the cave of Raghava Pandit, a close associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But his viraha, which is the pain in separation, went on increasing. Sometimes he lay unconscious in viraha for hours together. His indifference to body also increased. He lived only on buttermilk and the leaves of the neem tree. The result was that he became too weak. His disciples, particularly Sri Baladev Ram Gupta of Jaipur and Sri Shiva Charan Varsaneya of Ral, began to worry about his health. On their insistence, he went to Jaipur so that Baladev Ramji might take proper care of him. Still, there was no abatement in his viraha. In this condition, his soul would have departed from his body long before. But for the occasional appearance of Radha or Krishna before him in some form or other. Once, while he lived in Raghava Pandit cave, he saw Radharani along with her sakis picking flowers from a garden and smiling at him as if to reassure him that he continued to have her blessings. Once, while he and Baladev Ram were returning from a village to Jaipur after sunset, they lost their way in darkness and entered a jungle. They were trying to get out of the jungle when some tribal boys appeared on the scene. One of them, who looked most attractive, said to Baba, You will go to Jaipur. Come, I will show you the way. As he said this, he held Baba's hand. He had hardly gone a step or two with Baba when suddenly the scene changed. There was neither the jungle nor any of the tribal boys and Baba and Baladev Ramji found themselves standing near the Jaipur station. But tough these experiences came to Baba as oases in the desert and gave him temporary relief, they could not quench his thirst for darshan. It went on increasing until the limit was reached. On November 26, 1987, when he was still in Jaipur, he had a vision and a message from Radharani. He called Baladeva Ram and said to him, Radharani has called me to Vrindavan. Take me there. The next day, Baladeva Ram started with Baba in a car for Vrindavan. On the way, Baba went to meet some of his disciples and devotees and said to them while parting, I take leave of you. May Radharani bless you. Baba said this in a manner which indicated that he was going to leave them forever. This perturbed Baladev Ram. He began to think, is Baba really going to leave us all forever? Does Radharani's call mean call to eternal Vrindavan? But the thought 
was too much for him. He explained it away by thinking that Baba was going to live in Vrindavan for the rest of his life and would not return to meet his disciples and devotees of Jaipur again. Baba reached Vrindavan in the evening. He proposed to stay for some time with his devotee, Sri Atmaramji, who lived in Gyangudri. Gyangudani, written here, should be Gyangudri. So Baladev Ram took him there. After some time, he went with Baladev Ram to Loi Bazar. He purchased two pictures of Gornitai and Radha Krishna. Then he said to Baladev Ram, You go back to Atmaram's place. I shall return after meeting Murali Lal. Murali Lal was another devotee of Baba. Baladev Ram reached Atmaram's house, but Baba did not reach there until late at night. Baladev Ram and Atmaram Ji went to the house of Murari Lal to inquire about him. They were told that Baba had not gone there at all. For two days, Baladev Ram, Admaram, and Murari Lal searched every nook and corner of Vrindavan but could not find Baba. After two days, they read in Amar Ujjal newspaper that the dead body of a Mahatma was found in the cave underneath Radharani's Rang Mahal in Nidivan. A shudder went through their body. They rushed to the spot and found to their surprise and dismay and that it was the body of Radharaman Das Babaji. Since Baba's death had occurred in mysterious circumstances, the police carried his body to Mathura for post-mortem. The post-mortem was done. Nothing incriminatory was found. It was obvious that Baba had gone to Transcendental Vrindavan at the call of Radharani, who had accepted him in his Siddha Manjari there as her Saki in her Ranga Mahal or Nitya Nikunja in Transcendental Nidivan. Shri Radha Ramanda's Babaji Ki! Yeah. Heartbreaking story, oh my God. <laughs> Anyone like to share something, Ranga Sundar Baba? Or? <laughs> I think society is fine. <laughs> like, so many. Radharada Gurudev, are you there? Radha Radha. Very okay. nice, very nice story. Beautiful. I also listened to this story because it was in 80s. Wow. Yeah. He, he was in uh, Neduman and he got the darshan there. And he left his body. <coughs> Very nice. More is other pastime. Yeah. 
So we continue chapter 36, story of Shah Kundan Lal uh, or Lalit Kishore also, and Shah Pundan Lal or Lalit Madhuri. Shah Kundan Lal and Shah Pundan Lal, the builders of the famous and beautiful temple of Shahaji in Vrindavan were the sons of Shah Govindalal and the grandsons of Shah Biarilal, a fabulously rich landlord of Lucknow. Of Lucknow. Kundanlal was born in 1882 and Fundanlal in 1885. The two brothers inherited the enormous wealth of their grandfather, but they were richer in their samskaras of bhakti than in wealth. Since their childhood, they had loved Sri Krishna and Vrindavan and longed for an opportunity to go to Vrindavan to see their family, Thakur Radharaman, and the places connected with Krishna Lila, about which they had so far only read and heard. The opportunity came when Sahabi Arilal built the present temple of Radharaman in Vrindavan and a golden altar for Radharaman. He asked his grandsons to go to Vrindavan to deliver the altar. They went and as the darsh had the darshan of the exquisitely beautiful figure of Radharaman. The figure cast the deity, figure means deity here, the figure cast a magic spell upon them. What happened to them reminds us of the warning given by Rupa Goswami to anyone desirous of seeing his deity Govindaji. He has said in a sloka, Dear friend, if you want to enjoy life with your friends and relations, do not see the Sri Vrigaha, the Murti, the form of Sri Hari, called Govindadev in Keshi Tirtha, who stands there smiling in tries bent pose with a peacock feather on his crown <coughs> and a flute on his lips and who casts sidelong glances with his big eyes on the onlookers to steal their hearts. If you look at him once, you will forget their kit and kin and everything else. The two brothers forgot their kit and kin and everything else on seeing Radha Raman. They saw him every morning and evening and wanted to see him every day and serve him as best as they could until the end of their life. The sloka of Rupa Goswami was on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Lal a fabulously rich landlord of Lucknow. Okay, there is some printing mistake here. Again, it's coming the pages before. So let me see. Takura Rama Reporting. Mm 
Though engaged in various ways in the service of Radharaman and the Vaishnavas, Kundan Lal's heart always yearned for the direct service of Radharaman and Radharani. On Kartik Shukla Ratipada in the year 1873, he had a call from Radharani. The same day he took sannyas. The next morning he said to his brother, I have a call from Radharani. I must go, I must go, prepare for me a Chabutara, small platform, with Vraja Raja, the dust of Raja, to sit on pitch round its trunks of banana trees with leaves and decorate them with flowers and pictures of Radharaman so that it looks like Kunja, arbor. His brother was taken aback, but he started preparing the Kunja as instructed. After a couple of hours, when the kunja was ready, he sat down on the chabutara of Raja Raja inside the kunja and asked his people to perform kirtan. He also joined the kirtan. At that time, his face beamed with happiness. Tears flowed from his eyes tremor, horripilation, and stupor appeared on his body. After some time, he fixed his gaze upon the pictures of Radharaman, his wounds. <coughs> Do not see the Shivigraha of Shri called Govinda Dev in Keshi Tirta, who stands there smiling in thrice bent pose with a peacock feather, Again, your printing mistake, sorry. <laughs> Same parts are coming <laughs> in between. So again here, same as before, the feel of body and the country dress in general. Okay, so here already jump to the part where he left the body, but I think that was the end. Okay. <laughs> so... <coughs> okay, anyway, let's go how it is then. Everyone can recompose. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is some printing mistake. It may be that future becomes present and vice versa. Yeah, but here again, very difficult. Is this the only copy we have here? I think it's general. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right, Madhya Rasa, you also have no printing mistake. Everyone who has who has the book with you also have or time collapses into one. Yeah. Because now we go on, we leave the body, so <laughs> then we have to come back like it's not so. <laughs> the news of his passing away spread like fire in ground. One second, let, let us try to 
catch some point that Again, same. Okay, let's try. So I'm jumping some page here, which is mistakenly printed, and I'm Starting 371, page 371, at the first paragraph. Yeah. But they were not the masters of themselves. How could they stay in Vrindavan forever? They were expected to return after three or four days, but had stayed on, on for more than a month. They passed a few more days seeing the different places connected with Krishna Lila, then returned to Lucknow, leaving their hearts in Vrindavan. They began to pray to Radharani for her mercy so that she might cut asunder, what does it mean, asunder? Asunder. Uh, A-S-U-N-D-E-R, asunder, asunder. I don't know, they might cut asunder their bonds. Okay. She might cut their bonds of Maya. Yeah, that's better. And make it possible for them to live and do bhajan in Vrindavan. Both the brothers were also good poets and musicians. They began to pass their time in writing poetry and doing kirtan and thinking and talking always about Vrindavan. Shah Kundan Lal's collection of poems published under the title Habilasam Maduri reflects the state of mind at this time. After some time, Shah Biharilal, Shah Govindalal and his wife died suddenly, one after another. The clouds of Maya that had so far been casting their gloomy shadows upon the two brothers disappeared and their passage to Vrindavan seemed to have cleared. But the shackles of Maya were still too strong to let them fly at once to Vrindavan. The responsibility of managing the affairs of the big estate of Shahabi Harilal had suddenly fallen upon them. The estate was so big that Shahabi Arilal had to maintain an army for its protection. 
the title Shaha king, which was conferred upon him by the, the Nawab of Lucknow, was not simply an army leap for generations. <coughs> it seems that the deity now became even more restless than the Shah brothers to go to Vrindavan. He said to Shah Kundan Lal in a dream, take me to Vrindavan and build for me a temple there near Nidivan. Shah Kundan Lal was happy to receive the mandate directly from Radharaman. He decided to set aside all other considerations and go to Vrindavan as early as possible. As willed by Radharaman, there came at this time from Vrindavan Sri Radha Govinda Goswami, the Guru of Shaha Kundanlal. <coughs> On his going back, Kundan Lal gave him his deity and said, You take him with you to Vrindavan and serve him until I come. I shall also come soon. They wrote poetry under different names. Shah Kundan Lal under the name Lalit Kishori and Shah Fundan under the name Lalit Maduri. They are better known by these names. Muslim ruler Shah Kundan Lal, Muslim ruler. <laughs> okay, the fantasy story is <laughs> You have to imagine <laughs> some printing here is <laughs> Muslim ruler Shah Kun <laughs> collected a huge amount of wealth needed for the construction of a magnificent temple for his deity Radharaman. <coughs> the cavalcade consisted of the staff, bullock, car, soldier, and horseman. Look, here again, some part. <laughs> Shall we continue like this, or? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay, we read all, then we have to put the pieces together. Then we go back. By our own. <laughs> yeah. So the cavalcade, which will come at some point, <laughs> consisted of the staff, bullock, carts, soldiers, and horsemen. Army was necessary because during those days, bandits were at large Hello. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. The journey was long, and he had to pitch his camp for the night after going about 15 or 20 miles each day. The last camp was pitched just outside the border of Raja. The next morning, as usual, the servant brought the hookah and placed it before Shaha Kundanlal. Kundanlal kicked it off and never smoked hookah afterwards. Both the brothers also cast away their shoes because they could not traverse the holy land of Raja with shoes on. They entered barefooted into Braj and never put on shoes again. On reaching Vrindavan, they first stayed in the Kunja of Raja Patanimal, near the old temple of Radharaman. 
Some of the staff and the servants stayed with them. The rest of them and the army lived in camps on the bank of Yamuna. <coughs> the arrival of the Shah brothers in Vrindavan with their entourage and the army marked the beginning of a new chapter in Vrindavan. It infused in the Brajavasis a new sense of security. Their humility, magnificence, and their loving attitude towards them made them feel that they had in the two brothers their guardians who would take care of them in their moments of need and adversity. The Shah brothers arrived in Vrindavan in 1856. The year 1857 was the year of Indian uh, mutiny, which shook the British government at its roots. The whole country was in turmoil. The government, however, succeeded in suppressing the mutiny. After that, they started trying those who had helped the rebels and hanging them. Shah Kundan Lal had given shelter to rebel Hiroshina and his followers. A warrant was therefore issued against him and a date was fixed for his trial in a court in Mathura. A gloomy shadow of despair and despondency was cast all over Vrindavan. Everyone was deeply worried, but Shah Kundan Lal was calm and quiet and fearless as indicated by a poem which he composed at this time. Here is the poem. Is there a weapon sharper than the eyebrows of Govinda? One whom Govind has made the target of that weapon, why should he fear any other weapon or government? Undaunted and unruffled, I stand before the government to face the trial and its consequences. For I wear the armor of the protective eye of Govinda. Shah Kundan Lal went to Mathura performing Kirtan with thousands of his admirers and sympathizers and presented himself before the English magistrate. He was made to take the usual oath. After that, the magistrate said, Kundan Lal, do you know the rebel Hirasina? Yes, sir, replied Kundan Lal. Did you, at the time of mutiny, keep him, keep him and his men in your house and entertain them? Yes, sir. Do you know the punishment for giving shelter to a rebel? Yes, sir, it is death. If you know that, why did you support him? Sir, Irasinha was a bandit turned rebel. He came to Vraja for looting and plundering the Brajavasis. I threatened to attack him with my army, but promised to give him shelter if he did not do any harm to the Brajavasis. <coughs> he promised not to do any harm to anyone in Vraja. He lived up to his promise. I lived up to mine. <coughs> Thus, I saved Vraja from being ravaged and the people of Vraja from being looted and murdered by him. It is the duty of a government to protect its subjects and the duty of the people 
to serve the government. By giving shelter to Hiroshima, I only served the government in protecting its subjects. You are very clever. <coughs> you are twisting facts to hide your fault. You must be hanged. My God. Sir, you can hang me if you want. But before hanging the criminal, is asked what he wants. I tell you what I want. I want that you hang me in Vrindavan and let there be curtain at the time of hanging. If you hang me like this, I shall regard hanging not as a punishment, but as a reward. Are you ready to be hanged in this manner? Yes, sir. The magistrate was impressed by his devotion and fearlessness. <coughs> he thought that what he said was true. He announced the order for his release. The Brajavasis who had gathered in the cart and outside shouted, Shahad Kundalal Ki Jai! Rejoicing and singing and dancing in Sankirtan, they brought him back to Vrindavan. Shah Kundanlal soon applied himself to the task of building a temple for his deity Radharaman. The construction started in the year 1859 and was completed in 1867. Radharaman was installed in the temple with great eclat. The temple was called Lalit Nikunja, but it is generally known by the name Shahaji Kamandir, Shahaji Temple. Both the brothers served Radharaman with great devotion. They did not pass a single minute without bhajan and slept only for three or four hours. Shah Kundanlal was very much interested in Rasalila. He wrote dialogues and composed songs for the Lila <coughs> and trained the actors in dance and music. Sorry? Okay, yeah. He was also a reputed physician. He used all his talents in the service of Radharaman, the Vaishnavas and the Brajavasis. His fate in Vrindavan and the dust of Vrindavan was unique. So here is finished, but let's go back to some page before. Just one second, let's see.
Yeah, so probably there is some part missing completely, but there is one ending part here. Mm -hmm. So we can just go to that. On the Jesta Shukla Panchami of the year 1885, Shahafun Lal similarly passed away suddenly in good state of health, doing kirtan on a Chabutara of Raja Raja, thus of Vrindavan. The Samaris of both the brothers exist on either side of the gate of Lalita Nikunja. He, he left his physical body and the kunja of terrestrial Vrindavan to find himself soon in his transcendental body as Saki, in the loving embrace of Radharani in her kunja in celestial Vrindavan. <coughs> the news of his passing away spread like wildfire in every nook and corner of Vrindavan. Crowds of people began to pour in to pay homage to his departed soul. Arrangement began to be made for his funeral according to its own instruction. The sand of Yamuna was laid out on the lakes of Vrindavan. His body was gently dragged over it and taken round the main temples of Vrindavan. And finally it was laid in Samadhi. Shah Kundan Lal and Shah Fundan Lal Ki Jai. Gurudev, you know personally this family, right? The Shaji Temple. Gurudev knows. Yeah. <laughs> Roger Rade Gurudev. Okay, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> This is the temple, you know, when you, if you uh, need Ivan, have you ever been, everyone, like from Loi Bazar Gangotri, let's say, everyone have been to Gangotri, that I'm sure. So after Gangotri on the left, if you go always straight, then there is one arc, and inside that there is a very big square with a very huge temple of white marble, Aww. with, with twisted kind of columns. Pillars. Oh yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is the Shahji temple. And actually they make a very nice, uh, they have one, uh, I don't remember, it's called exactly like holy room. They have one very beautiful room that in holy is open. No, actually it was San Panchami, so it's gone to holy. Anyway, one you can see on the internet, one beautiful room they have in the temple. It was San Panchami, they open for two days with so many lamps, and lights, like very amazing to see that. Mm. And Gurudev uh, Prashanji knows the present in charge family of that. They are good friends. Mm. Mm. I have this poem that he had written while waiting for trial, <coughs> and then he had said that uh, the most powerful <coughs> was uh, Krishna's glance. But is it that he had said after this, but even more powerful is his target? Is that the understand it correctly? Because he had said in his poem that the most powerful weapon was Krishna's glance, but I thought he had said that the more powerful is the target. So the poem is Is there a weapon sharper than the eyebrows of Govinda, one whom Govinda has made the target of that weapon? So the target, like the receiver. 
he means the receiver, one who chose to be the receiver of that weapon. Why should he fear any other weapon or government? Shall we go on? There is a very, very beautiful story now yeah. we can read today of Gulab Saki. Okay. So we continue with Gulab Saki, chapter 37. In Barsana, there is a place called Pili Poker. Pili Poker is where Vinod Baba is living. For so those who have been to Vinod Baba, this place. As we go from Pili Pokar to Prem Sarovar, we see a small and old Chabutra or platform in the adjoining forest. The platform is called Gulabsaki Kachabutra. Even today, people bow down to it as they pass by. Gulab Saki was a poor Mohammedan Muslim who lived in Barsana, the abode of Radharani, since his birth. Since his birth, he had rolled in the holy dust of Barsana, breathed the air of Barsana, charged with bhav and bhakti, and enjoyed the company of the Brajavasis of Barsana. He was a Mohammedan only by birth. His life was cast in the same mold in which was cast the life of the Brajavasis of Barsana. He was very humble and simple at heart. Though illiterate, he was a good Saranji player. Saranji is a bow instrument, like violin, but not really, but bow kind of instrument, string instrument. He played Saranji regularly at the time of Kirtan in the temple of Radharani. <coughs> he had a daughter about seven or eight years old whose name was Radha. Of course. <laughs> she danced while he played Saranji in the temple. Her dance was enchanting. For the service he rendered in the temple, he was paid a small salary of rupees eight or ten. But he got Radharani's Prashad both the times, which was enough for him and his daughter. He was happy and contented. There was nothing else that he wanted. He loved his daughter very much. He was so satisfied with his service to Radharani by his music and her dance at the temple both morning and evening, that he felt as if he lived in the highest paradise. He never thought that his daughter would be married one day and his paradise will come to an end. But the daughter came of age and had to be married. The Gosfamis of Varsana all loved his daughter. They often say to him, Gulab, Radha has come of age. Why don't you marry her? Every time they say it so, he replied, Where is the wherewithal required for marriage? The Goswamis decided to raise money for her marriage and ask him to look for a suitable boy. Fortunately, he found a suitable boy and Radha was married. 
she went with her husband and Gulab was left alone. Gulab was no more the old, happy and cheerful Gulab. Cruel fate had cast its darkest shadow upon him. He not only lost his cheerfulness, but also his sleep and appetite. For three days and three nights, he had been sitting at the door of Radharani's temple and weeping. He only wept and sighed and cried, Radha, Radha. The Goswamis thought he would go mad. They tried to console him, but in vain. On the third day at 12 o'clock at night, when he was lying at the door of the temple with eyes closed, he heard the voice of his daughter. She said, Baba, I have come. <laughs> Will you not play Saranji so that I may dance? It is difficult to say whether Gulab was sleeping or awake. But he saw with his eyes closed that his daughter danced and he played Saranji. That night her dance was much more enchanting and the jingle of the ornament she wore round her ankles much more pleasing to the ear and captivating to the heart than usual. It was found to be so because it was not really his daughter, Radha, but Radharani herself who was dancing in the guise of, of his daughter. Gulab realized this because the, the transcendental jingle of the anklets of Radharani had opened his physical eyes as well as spiritual. <coughs> he looked at her with eyes wide open and wet with tears and said, Lali! In Raj, the father affectionately calls his daughter Lali. Gulab was infused with parental love towards Radharani because she had appeared to him as his daughter. Lali, as he wanted to say something more, moving towards her with heart full of affection. She ran towards the temple, Henny ran after her. After this, Gulab was never seen anywhere. The Goswamis thought that he could not bear the separation of his daughter. So he died or committed suicide. They constructed the Chabutra already mentioned in his memory. One day, when a Goswami, who was the Pujari of Radharani's temple, was returning from the temple after performing arti and putting Radharani to sleep, he heard someone from behind a cluster of trees in the adjoining forest calling, Goswamiji, Goswamiji. He turned round and said, who is that? Your Gulab, came the reply, 
and Gulab came out of the forest. Goswami was surprised to see him. He said, Did you not die? Gulab told him the whole story about Radharani's appearance to him as his daughter and added, She has kindly accepted me as her Saki, girl companion. I've just come after playing Saranji to her as she lay down to sleep. Here is her Prashadi Pana, a roll of betel leaf with bits of betel nut, lime, spices, and katechu to be chewed. Here is her Prashadi Pana, Pan, sorry. Here is her Prashadi Pan, have it. Gulab gave the pan to Goswamiji. He was surprised to see that it was the same pan which he had just offered to Radharani. From this time, Gulab began to be called Gulab Saki. What sadhana, one might ask, Gulab had practiced to deserve such mercy of Radharani. He was not even initiated by a guru. Don't the Shastras say that initiation by a Vaishnav guru and the practice of one or more of the nine kinds of bhakti are essential conditions for the attainment of the mercy of Radha and Krishna? The only thing Gulab did to win over Radharani was that he wept at her door and cried, Radha, Radha. But how could that melt Radharani's heart? Was she aware that he was crying for his daughter? not for her? It is difficult to answer this question. It may, however, be pointed out that the conditions and the rules and regulations of the Shastras are for us, not for Radharani. Radharani is all merciful. When the ocean of her mercy swells, it crosses all barriers of scriptural rules and regulations. The rules are for us, for Radharani, the exceptions. And as we say, the exceptions prove the rules. It may also be observed that Gulab was humble, pure in heart, and free from all kinds of offenses. Radharani's mercy flows more easily towards persons who are pure in heart than towards those who are not pure in heart, howsoever long and arduous be the course of sadhana they may have practiced. <coughs> Gulab had not practiced japa, tapa, austerity, or any other kind of sadhana. That could be noticed from outside. <coughs> His life itself was a silent sadhana. He had adopted sarangji service in the temple of Radharani, primarily as his way of life. It was only secondarily a means of his livelihood. <coughs> he could have gone out of Barsana to earn a better living by displaying his art elsewhere, but he could not even for a moment think of giving up the service to Radharani. 
He was completely surrendered to Radharani. Everything that belonged to him, including his daughter, was for him a means for the service of Radharani. <coughs> After Radha was gone, he was weeping and crying for her, not because of his attachment for her as his daughter, but because she was for him an indispensable means for the service of Radharani. How could Radharani prevent her mercy from flowing freely towards a surrendered soul like him? Gulab Saki Ki Jai!